Hello, welcome to the episode of the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Gann. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today we have another freedom fighter, another liberty warrior, somebody who's been out there really fighting the good fight for a number of years now with sound economic research. Someone who's also up in West Texas and, and Lubbock and Texas Tech, my alma mater, uh, do a lot of great work at the Free Market Institute, but has just been doing a lot of good research for a number of years now. And it's none other than Dr. Benjamin Powell. Ben, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Hey, great to be with you. Good, Ben, good. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on. And um, today we're recording on January 19th, 2023. And we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about. We're talking a little bit about your background, a little bit about immigration, a little bit about why socialism you know, sucks and things of that nature. We've got a lot to go through. But let me start off with your um, bio. I'm just going to shorten it a little bit for the audience. And I'll have this posted on the show notes page, advancedgan.substack.com. But Ben Powell is the executive director of the Free Market Institute and a professor of economics in the Jerry S. Rawls College of Business Administration at Texas Tech University. Guns up. Professor Powell is a senior fellow with the Independent Institute, secretary um, treasurer of the Southern Economic Association, secretary treasurer of the Association of Private Enterprise Education, and the treasurer of the Mott Pellerin Society. I told you, he's a busy man. He earned his BS in economics and finance from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell and his MA and PhD in economics from George Mason University. He's the author of a number of books, um, one of those being The Economics of Immigration that we're going to talk about today. Another one, like I said, with Socialism Sucks, with Dr. Bob Lawson, who I've also had on the, on the Let People Prosper show recently. Um, you can also find his writings in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Dallas Morning News, just a number of places to find his great work. Um, so please check that out. I'll put some more of those links on the show notes page as well. So with all that said, Ben, what motivates you to really do what you do each and every day? Well, first of all, on a day like today, I guess it's the uh, opportunity to come on a show where the theme is uh, redheads and blue sport jackets. Uh, I can see we've engineered that uh, spontaneously here today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's right. But, uh, you know, more generally, I, I love economics and uh, my research interests vary. I've done a lot of development economics, uh, migration economics comparative economic systems on socialism, capitalism, but tons of public policy stuff. And quite often, if there's a unifying theme, it's whatever's been pissing me off most most recently. It says, hey, let's go use economics to look into this more and explain it and, and try to get some sanity into the world. Well, that sounds great. And I love that. You know, it's a lot of the reasons why I do this, this show, Let People Prosper, is to bring on great folks like you, talk about different things that are hot button topics to solve the problems that we face today. You know, I remember one of the first times that we met, you were at the Texas Public Policy Foundation's policy orientation. And one of you, and part of your presentation that it stuck with me, I mean, to this day, Ben, is you said, you know, a lot of times politicians are thinking about what they should do. Why not give nothing a chance? And too often we don't do that. Like politicians just don't want to give nothing a chance. And so, well, you know, what's kind of your reasoning for that? Well, the uh, entrepreneurs in the marketplace are really good at solving problems and making our lives better. Politicians are really good at gumming up the works. And there's certainly a do something bias in politics so that they can go on TV and say, I have done this and signal to the voters that they, they're active and that they care. But often the best thing to do is put your feet up on the desk and, and take a nap like Cal Coolidge did when he was president. I just was reading uh, a couple of quotes today about from H.L. Mencken, who was hammering on Cal while he was in office and afterwards says, I wish we had more presidents that snored and napped like he did. <laughs> Amen. That's right. That's right. You know, at the Free Market Institute, would you mind telling the audience a little bit about what you do there? Sure. We're, we're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary now, now Vance. Wow. Uh, the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University was founded to promote the study and teaching of free market economics. Uh, we have uh, counting affiliated faculty, about 10 faculty members across multiple colleges and departments at the university, even a satellite office down at San Angelo State. One of the main things we do is train PhD students to become uh, professors and go out and teach other students these ideas. I think we've got 15 PhD students that are on fellowship with us this semester. But then we also do outreach like this on media and, and writing for pop audiences, conduct research, write books. We all share common research uh, interest in freedom and free enterprise. Yeah, we've had um, Dr. Alex Salter on, uh, another good friend, and he, we, we talked a lot about monetary rules and things of that nature. And so he's another one that who's there at the Free Market Institute doing some some great work. And I can't believe it's already been a decade, Ben. That, that's fantastic. And I remember when it was first started and everything. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't open whenever I was there uh, at the Department of Economics when I got my PhD, but I've definitely followed the work that I've done over a number of years. Um, and I hope it continues. Keep, keep up the good work. Um, what would you say is kind of your 
groundings, when you think about economics and your economic way of thinking, what are some of the schools of economic thought or individuals who have really guided you um, throughout your career? A number of different schools of thought. I'm not re religiously uh, dedicated to one particular one, but taking ideas from them that help us explain things in the world. So I learned a lot from various Austrian economists, public choice economists, UCLA property rights economist, Chicago price theorist. I guess I could be called uh, methodologically promiscuous in that really I change the tools depending what the problem is that I'm interested in. I don't let the tools dictate what problems I'm, I'm going to look at. Uh, I think there's lots of good ideas out there in lots of schools of thought of, of economics and uh, to grab whichever ones are, are applicable to the particular thing that's being investigated. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think too often sometimes we take it as a religion, like you've got to be, a, you got to adopt this certain school of thought, um, but you're right. There are a number of ways to think about things. Uh, I would think about mine as being more of a Austrian, public choice, Chicago, uh, and uh, institutional economics. Doug North has had a huge influence on me over time. Dr. P. P. Betke and I, you know, talked about that whenever he was on recently. And I think that's important to have these different schools of thought to think about and, and for the audience as well. Um, well you know, but P. with you, he, has a, he does a wonderful book, Living Economics, that I'm sure you've read. And he blends all these schools together there. And he calls it the main line of economic thought from Adam Smith to the current day Vernon Smith. And uh, when that came out, I said, you know, Pete, I love it. It's great because you used to want to claim all these people were Austrian economics. And what you were doing was defining Austrian so broadly that it just included everything you liked. I'm like, now you've got a new name for everything you like. And he's like, yeah, yeah, OK. I'm like, by the way, there's a couple of Austrian economists like Shackle and Lachman that really don't fit into the main line. So they're out now. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. They're good, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, those are great books. Yeah, the mainline economics, another good one to check out. With, with your research, where would you kind of start? Like if you were telling somebody, hey, this is what my research is all about, where do you usually start? Because you've written on a number of things, sweatshops, immigration, socialism sucks. Kind of where would you start your, your timeline? Well, I usually start with what I've been working on now. And right now I've actually gone back to some of the sweatshops and development stuff with one of our graduate students here. But also last couple of years, I've been doing a lot on economic freedom and, and COVID. I mean, COVID, the, the policies adopted after COVID came out are the biggest restrictions on economic freedom I've experienced in my lifetime for sure. And, uh, you know, what I wanted to do, and I worked with another one of our PhD students here on this, is the existing measures of economic freedom across states, across countries, they really miss all of the COVID regulations. They pick up the government funding and bailouts of stuff of how it affects spending and taxation, but they miss the lockdown regulations, the school closing, stuff like that. So we've been working on transforming um, uh, stringency indexes that measure COVID more generally into economic freedom of regulation from COVID, and then merging it into economic freedom indexes and, and seeing how that changes things. And so all of a sudden, you know, countries, you know, people will talk, they're wrong, but they'll talk about socialist Sweden, uh, which is not, it's one of the top 25%, you know, freest countries in the world anyway. But then during COVID, they actually start moving up in those rankings like that. And meanwhile, later, not so much in 2020, just because of the ways it was done, but things like New Zealand, Australia, who are usually re really very economically free, of course, plummet once you start to account for the draconian style lockdowns that, that they had. So that's one thing I've been doing a lot of, of recently. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, those are were some um, strenuous draconian, to your point, of lockdowns and pandemic, you know, it, and there was a lot of regulations at the same time that were removed that I hope that we can learn from, like the occupational licensing sort of uh, removal of those regulations that I hope will continue. A lot of those, I think, have come back online. But it, but if, if, it, if it's not good during a pandemic, or during an emergency, why should it be good at all? Kind of, kind of to your point, give nothing a chance. Yeah, and you know, as a guy who wrote the socialism sucks with the subtitle, two economists drink their way through the unfree world. I was uh, also a fan of the to-go alcohol options, uh, but I do think, in terms of kind of empirical magnitude of importance, the rollbacks that we saw of regulation were trivial compared to the uh, big increases in regulation of our activities. Um, yeah, that's right. You know, I, I, at that time, and I know you as well, we, we were both kind of writing about how this is not a good situation. We don't need to be shutting things down, that there are better ways to go about it. Because at, at, at that time, you know, they were sidelining the entrepreneur, the one who's going to look at prices and the mechanisms that come up with things faster. I know there's a lot of talk about, um, what is it, Operation Warp Speed, of how quickly things came online. But just think about how much faster it would have been if it was the private sector, you know, that it, it's not ruled by regulation and government saying what should happen and what should not. And, you know, I just think it was a terrible idea for things to be shut down. And, and look, I was in the White House when all that was going on. Um, I was writing a lot of internal documents saying we should not head in this direction. But I wonder kind of what your some more of your thoughts were during that time. Yeah, I was embarrassed that so much of the economics profession abandoned good price theory. 
So you know, a lot of economists said, well, there's an externality, a spillover, because one person's contagious can spill over. And, oh, externality, well, okay, well, we can have regulation. Well, no, just because you have an externality doesn't mean you can have any old regulation. You have to tailor it to the nature of what those externalities are. And a large part of the COVID externality is internalized when you're on private businesses. Everybody walked into a place where they either had a reaction of, uh, this is ridiculously restricted of what I can do here, I don't want to hang out, or walked in and said, oh my God, I'm going to catch COVID really quick in here. And, mm -hmm. But because people have those reactions, businesses have an incentive to tailor their policies to their customers' needs, and different businesses will have different policies. Now, that doesn't fully internalize the externality, but does a lot of it. And I think if economists think seriously through the nature of externalities and price theory, what you get for a scope of government regulation during COVID is just so minuscule compared to what we actually saw of blanket shutdowns that uh, massively disrupt people enjoying their lives. Yeah, uh, it's unfortunate. I think we're still learning a lot of those costs, whether it be the schools being closed and the the learning loss that has happened and things of that nature, which is one reason why I hope we have school choice <laughs> here, in, here in Texas. There's a big push for that right now. Um, Invite my buddy Alex Salter back. He, he's all about school choice right now. He's got, a, I don't know how many op-eds circulating at Texas Papers at this moment. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He's, he's all on it. So uh, we're going to keep on that property tax relief and other things. But but Ben, I think you know one reason why I wanted to have you on is there's a lot of discussion about two big issues that I know your research and that you've been writing and talking a lot about from the right and from the left. And the two big ones are immigration and trade, international trade, right? Um, and with immigration, I think that there's this concern, right, that that they're taking our job. They, the immigrants are taking people's jobs, that there's a cost to them overall. And, you know, we see all these people that are flooding the border right now, the, the Texas border, and that's bringing up other sort of humanitarian issues. Um, now, now, that could be created because of the immigration system we have in place. Place, right. But but there are a lot of issues that people I don't know that they're quite aware of what's happening there. Um, and the same thing with trade, right? Trade, China's taking our jobs and things of that nature. And I wonder from your perspective and your economic view of thinking about things, um, how would you explain these to people? Yeah, well, listen, there's a lot in common between the two, because international trade and in goods and services and international trade and labor, i.e. migration, are really very economically similar. They both involve switching who does what so that we do what is in economic speak, our comparative advantage or what we are best, relatively best at producing that make the economic pie bigger. So that's not to say there's not problems associated with either and that there's different aspects of those problems depending which one you're talking about. But at its core, they're both ways to make the pie bigger by letting people specialize in what they do best. Because there's some things, some, to some extent, there's substitutes for each other. So listen, I, you said my undergrad was UMass Lowell, the heart of the Industrial Revolution. I grew up in Haverhill, Massachusetts, known as the shoe city for 19th century shoe production. Those, those uh, old Industrial Revolution factories, at first it was women who worked in them who were leaving the farms. Then it was Irish immigrants. Then it was Italian immigrants. Then it was Eastern European immigrants and Jewish immigrants. Then 1920, the border basically closes and we cut off the Ellis Island immigration policy. Well, what was happening? The workers who are best suited to work in the factories were moving to those factories. What happened after 1920? We get to the past, the interwar years are a mess. You get to post-World War II and we have a more restricted immigration policy. And instead, the factories started moving to the workers, first to the American South, then into Latin America and East Asia of the, the you know apparel type manufacturing. Uh, so to some extent, they're substitutes for each other. But there's some things that you need migration for because you just can't trade them internationally. I can't outsource my lawn care to Mexico. If it's Mexicans who are best suited to doing my lawn care, they have to be able to come to where the lawn is. Ditto with a lot of agricultural production and other things as well. So the economics underlying both are really similar. The complications with immigration are a little bit different. When it comes to Stealing our jobs, that's a common one to both. That's a misconception. There's no economist worth his salt who believes that either on net steals jobs. They change the mix of jobs that a native born population will do. And by the way, that's the whole idea. If it didn't change the mix of jobs we did, we wouldn't get the economic gains that make us wealthier. It's allowing us to go and do what we're relatively best at, which means stopping doing what we're not relatively best at. You gotta have the churn to get the gain. So there's no economist who doesn't say, oh yeah, we lose jobs in the process. It's just, we don't lose them on net because we create new ones and what we're relatively better at. Uh, so I think this is a common fear among the public on both migration and trade that is just not well grounded in social science. Wage impacts, for the most part, wages go up afterwards. We could study particular groups that at least in the short run might see wage decreases when they're direct substitutes for either the immigrant or the uh, country that we're trading with. 
Uh, this is particularly relevant for prior immigrants to the United States who are low skilled when more low skilled immigrants come in. But overall, the skill set of the immigrants coming in is different than the native born labor force, which makes them uh, in econ speak sub uh, complements rather than substitutes for us, which helps raise our wages over time. In either case, the pie gets bigger. And with migration, the pie gets a lot bigger because we have not just these standard economic gains, but what economists talk about as the productivity of place. Take a Haitian out of Haiti, drop them in the United States, their productivity goes up by about a thousand percent with nothing changing about them. What changed is the environment they operate in. We're in a place that has better property rights, better economic freedom, better rule of law, more physical capital, better technology. And all of a sudden they become more productive. The same would go in reverse. If they took me out of Lubbock, Texas and dropped me in Haiti, I wouldn't be nearly as productive there as what I can be here. Uh, so that's something that's different about the economics of migration than just trade and goods and services. And it's different in a good way because it makes the gains a lot bigger. Now, this doesn't mean I want to trivialize problems, but I talked too long for an interview, so I'll stop huh. now. And you can you can decide which one you want to ask me about. Dude. <laughs> well, well, no, those are all good, Ben. I think it's heading in the direction that I kind of wanted to go with the conversation. Um, you know, one re way that I talk a lot about with immigration or just in trade in general. Let's get away from, like you, like you were saying, I mean, it brings in together a lot of economics with trade and immigration, but just trade in general, right? Like I don't know how to change a, um, a ceiling fan in my house. I have no interest in learning. I, I, I don't want to do it. Somebody else is, is going to be able to do that, who is going to be better positioned. That's where the comparative advantage, more productive specialization can all start to come in. I don't mow my yard. I have someone else who does that, right? And, and, and I think whenever we think about this one-on-one -on -one trade, we lose sight of the gains of trade that we get on a day-to-day -day basis that we don't even really think about. But as soon as we start bringing in migrants from other countries, because we don't, maybe we don't like them, or we see that they're a cost of otherwise, or if there's trade, then somehow we've come out from that one-on-one -on -one trade benefits to saying that there's a problem with this, and then we need government to come in and solve it. And it's like, no, 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 we need to make sure that, you know, there, there are the same rules of the game and things of that nature. But why that, do we like it whenever there's one-on-one -on -one and we benefit from the trade, but somehow we see it as everyone else is having this cost. And that is what I think is gets lost a lot of times within the political environment. Maybe some of that's from the public choice ideas of incentives matter and people are trying to win votes. So they need someone else to blame. But, but another big issue here is that, you know, if we blame China for all of our problems, we have our fingers, and I've said this before, but we have our fingers pointed, one finger pointed at China, but we've got three other fingers pointed at ourselves. Maybe, maybe our costs are too high. Uh, those are some of the things I was thinking, but, but go ahead. So Vance, I think you're, you're spot on here. And it's classic all the way back to Adam Smith, that trade's mutually beneficial between individuals and international trade is just an extension of that. The United States and China do not trade. American citizens trade with Chinese citizens and companies. And when we do, it's no different than Vance, you and your, your contractor who does your, your ceiling fan, each of you expects to benefit. If the guy who did your ceiling fan moved here from Mexico, that would not change the fact that the two of you expect gains from trade from doing this. Somehow people get, they drink the crazy juice when you start talking about international trade and it's this country and that country. No, it's just people cooperating. That's what trade is. I do something for you, you do something for me, we're both better off. And just put two people on different sides of a border, either when they're shipping a good across it or when they're coming across it to provide the service, doesn't change that fundamental insight. And really barriers to trade, be they tariffs and quotas or immigration quotas, are just barriers to people cooperating across lines politicians draw on maps. Yep, uh, that's right. Whenever you're asked about what's going on at the Texas border, and you know we have these issues that are going on there. What's what's your response from more of a free market angle of what's happening? You know what is the solution here? Yeah, I think that current government policy and the result that's going on at the Texas border is bad for everybody. It's bad for businesses in the United States who would like to employ immigrants. It's bad for immigrants who are trying to come here and realize an American dream and improve their lives. And it's bad for Texans who are down on the border. It's violating everybody. I, I always avoid the phrase open borders uh, because it's politically loaded and very confusing of what people mean with it. The southern border is not open. If mm. so, no one would pay coyotes thousands of dollars to smuggle them across. They'd simply walk across. So we know it's not open, but it's also not controlled well either. It's chaotic. Now, I when I talk about immigration, I think it's a massive gain to the immigrants. It's a net gain to the native born people in the United States. The fiscal concerns are mostly localized, not on net overall, that immigration is good for America, just like it always was. But that doesn't mean that it should be done the way that it's doing right now. Personally, I favor Ellis Island immigration. 
Ellis Island immigration, by that I mean, don't restrict the quantity, bring me your wretched refuse, your huddled masses, but let them come through legal checkpoints. And we won't put a big quantitative restriction on, but we can check them and make sure they're not known criminals or terrorists. If you have particular concerns about some contagious diseases for quarantines, but that then frees up your border resources to worry about the criminals who are trying to do criminal things other than an activity that, in my view, shouldn't be criminal, walking across to come make a better life for yourself. But right now, you've got ranchers and property owners who are getting trespassed against, cities that are getting uh, these camps of, of migrants who are stuck stuck there and can't integrate into our economy the correct way. I think the current policy is a mess, but I don't think the answer is just greater enforcement. It's got to be greater paths to legally coming into the United States so that we can realize the gains from trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, a border wall is creating this wall, this barrier, no one else is going to come across. And to me, from, from my view, is that that is just, uh, that's a scapegoat. It, it's a, it's a, it's something that's going to be out there. I mean, I actually think we're going to say tear it in this wall one day um, because they're just going to find other ways to get around the wall. It's just another barrier. It's another opportunity cost, but the, their, their, their gains for coming over are so much greater that this, yeah. this wall isn't going to matter. It, it's really a function of we need key immigration reform. We, we need a, a better visa system, to your point, of getting the people over here that, that need to come for whatever the reason is. You know, why are we limiting the growth rate? I mean, another part of this, to your point earlier about growing the pie, is when you have more people, you have more knowledge. You have more innovators. You have more entrepreneurs and things of that nature. Yes, there are going to be some of those who are going to be succumb to the system and be, be dependent on the programs that are out there. But that's a reason to cut the welfare system system, <laughs> not, not to cut off the immigrations and the immigrants in the process. Sure. And, you know, for a large part, immigrants don't have immediate access to yep. welfare state transfer benefits. But there are things like schools that their children have access to, hospitals and other costs. So I think, you know, conservatives, when they just say it's not compatible because of taxes, they're not being very creative. So and for the by the way, the overall evidence for most immigrants, they're a net tax gain. Mm -hmm. Low skilled old immigrants are a net tax drain. Most of the others are positive overall. You can find studies, by the way, that tell you anything about this, though. But if you look at the more responsible ones, they cluster around that type of, of, of finding. But let's just say they were a drain. If immigrants become drastic, I mean, a Haitian, that nine, that 1000 percent more productive, more higher income by moving here. What if you put a one percent immigrant surtax on? Sure. Come on into the United States, but pay an extra one percent of your salary above and beyond whatever your income tax rate would be. And we'll use that to set off, offset the drains. Some wouldn't contribute very much. Some would found a company and contribute a whole bunch. Whatever the number, 1%, 5%, I don't really care. It's not going to change the number of immigrants coming in very much. And it would solve any fiscal concerns uh, that arise. Yeah, and, and then just real quick on the trade part, there's a lot of talk about um, international trade for trade deficits, which you have to look at the current account, which is the flow of goods and services versus the capital account, which is the flow of the capital goods that come in. Um, and, and and to me, it's really more about the volume of trade, not necessarily these trade deficits or surplus. But again, going back to your point earlier, it's the individuals, Americans trading with the Chinese or the, the Mexicans or someone else, that is what's creating the situation for the flow of funds. It, these other sort of measures are you know, accounting identities, but they're not necessarily important for the bigger scheme of things when you're thinking about the overall economy, right? I think the trade deficit statistic is the most overrated economic statistic there is. And there's plenty of BS economic statistics out there, but it has absolutely no normative significance of what's going on. So as you said, there's two different accounts. We put goods and services in one of them. That's what we get when we talk about trade deficit. You got a capital account that's the other one. So how many times have you seen a headline, Vance, that says record capital account surplus with China? I haven't Never. seen that one. No. Every time you see one that says trade deficit, the other one by accounting identity is true. And all that means, though, back to the two people swapping, it means somebody wanted to swap an asset for a good or service. We do that in the domestic economy all the time, and it doesn't mean you're better off or it doesn't mean that you're worse off when you sell an asset in order to buy a good or service. In fact, the very fact that you're doing it demonstrates that you believe it makes you better off. When we add up any group of people, be they in Lubbock, Texas, the state of Texas, or the United States and add up net how many assets one sent one way and goods. It's still just as meaningless. It's the summation of a bunch of mutually beneficial trades. Uh, I wish we just didn't even collect these statistics. Yep. That makes sense. Well, that kind of is a good segue here now to what's going on in Texas. I know you've been looking at some things of what's happening in some of the, our legislative session here in Texas just started January 10th. And so there's a lot of bills that have been filed. There's budgets and there's property tax relief. But what are some of the things that you've been looking at here recently? 
Oh, the one that I was just looking at is this House bill, uh, excuse me, S Senate bill, I guess, then uh, 147. And what it would do is it would prohibit Texans from selling land, physical land, to not just the governments, but also companies headquartered in, companies whose majority stockholders are located in, and individual citizens of China, Iran, Russia, and North Korea. I think this is a disaster. It's a prohibition on a type of international trade for Texans. Uh, and it violates Texas property. Now, I, I understand this saying this is for national security restraint concerns and these authoritarian regimes. And they are authoritarian, crappy regimes. And I think we could think about national, legitimate national security concerns and how to address them with national policy targeting those governments and its leaders. But this blanket prohibition on cooperating with anybody from these countries by selling land, this is, you know, the, the bill supporter, she had uh, some quote like, uh, this still ensures that Texans remain in control of Texas land. No, it does no such thing. What it does is it replaces Texans' control of their own land, their property rights, which include their ability to choose who and on what terms to sell their land to, and it replaces it with government command and control. That's what these authoritarian regimes that are being targeted do, not the Great Republic of Texas. So we should be upholding property rights. And you know, you mentioned the segue to international trade. This is back to that capital and current account. We have a net trade deficit with China. That means on net, Americans choose to sell assets, which includes land, to Chinese citizens and companies in order to buy goods and services that, enjoy, that we enjoy and improve our standard of living. Prohibiting sale of land, which is one of those assets, limits Texans' ability to engage in those gains from trade. Now, this is kind of what I focused on with it, but also just on an even more personal level, Chinese citizens, I know many of them, some of whom live in this state, some who live in other US states, who are professors like me here, who love freedom and free enterprise, and who have no plans to go back to China, but they're still Chinese citizens because it's a long process, this ties into your immigration, to become a citizen of the United States. So all of a sudden, we want a professor who's teaching free enterprise in Texas to not be able to engage in the American dream and buy a home in Texas. That's thoroughly un-American. Well said. No, I think I think you're exactly right. And it's something that, you know, concerns me from the progressive left, of course, but also from the right. When you hear a lot about the national conservatives, there's a movement afoot for there to be that the, the private sector is the problem, you know, that these these certain big tech companies are the problem or other sort of companies are the problem. And, and getting away from the, the issue, in my view, my default is that the government's the problem. <laughs> it's from government failures, kind of like this trade issue is, is the government is too big here in America, too much spending, too high of taxes, too high of minimum wages. So we priced out a lot of these people to go elsewhere. Now, maybe they should anyway, but but we shouldn't be pushing people in that direction overall. Um, and so, you know, I, I wonder what your kind of concerns are from more classical liberal perspective whenever you see kind of the right and the left almost going towards big government. Yeah, I mean, real conservatives in America is conserving the principles of, Amer of the American Le Revolution, which is a classical liberal re revolution. And that means individual freedoms, freedom, free enterprise, civil liberties across the board, and allowing people to choose for themselves, not government saying this is in the national interest, and I'm going to limit your choices to choose for yourself to promote some goal that I have for the rest of you. I think national conservatism is just not conservatism in the US context. It's authoritarian rightism over particular goals that's no less authoritarian than some of the authoritarian left out there. But, but neither one of them respect individual freedom and private enterprise. Both want to tell you what the outcome should be and that you're a cog in the system and you should be part of their outcome. I think both are mistaken. Yep, no, I agree. Well, um, that's going to wrap us up here today, but please check out his, his great book, Socialism Sucks, um, Economics of Immigration, and a whole bunch more that I'm going to put on the show notes page at advancedscan.substack.com. Um, ben, hopefully Texas Tech Red Raiders, the basketball team, will start doing better. I know you go to a lot of the games. W what's going to help us to overcome some of these obstacles, or can we this season? Uh, we're a young, young team that's immature and making a lot of mistakes getting together. A lot of talent on that team. Hopefully we don't see a lot in a transfer portal next year. And when we come back, we'll be playing for the top of the Big 12, I think, going forward. There we go. Guns up. Well, I continue to do great, great work there at the Free Market Institute of Texas Tech. And just in general, Ben, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, God bless you and your family. And um, for all the audience, thank you. Please rate us a five-star rating um, and, and let people prosper.